In April 2022, the Netflix series Heartstopper was released to widespread acclaim. It primarily follows a budding friendship turned love story between two British teenage boys at a single sex grammar school. They are Nick and Charlie, played by Kit Connor and Joe Locke, and the series, directed by Aeros Lim, is based on a popular webcomic and series of graphic novels of the same name. They were created by acclaimed author, illustrator, and now screenwriter, Alice Oseman. Since the show's release, the Heart of fandom has exploded, with so many people finding comfort in the story's depiction of the young British queer experience. I'm Natalie Townsend, and I'm a BFI Film Academy Young Programmer. I'm in charge of this LFF for free event, which we are calling Heartstopped. This project is a collection of interviews through which we will explore how Heartstopper came to be the success it is. Through this lens, we can then discuss greater themes on queer representation, fandom, and independent storytelling. Thank you so much for joining me today, and let's get into the event. So I first um, discovered Heartstopper when it was um, self-published by Alice Oseman through a Kickstarter campaign. I went to Alice's website and I ordered a copy of the Kickstarter backed self-published uh, version of volume one. And I, I read it. I think I'd read it a bit online before then already because Alice puts it at the webcomic, uh, you know, lives there too. So um, it was such an easy and beautiful story to dive into. Um, and I just completely fell for the way she drew the characters, the will they won't they romance between Nick and Charlie and the sense of romance and excitement uh, was just really thrilling. And it felt like something I hadn't experienced before with characters of that age. So Heartstopper as a webcomic, I was familiar with it because back in the day I was uh, chronically online, but in a different way on Tumblr. And um, it would always kind of crop up every now and then uh, amongst, you know, as the algorithm kind of, you know, views stuff on your feed. Um, I remember when I saw kind of like murmurs of, of this project coming through, uh, there was talk about it. And to the point that when the trailer dropped, I was like, I know this, I recognise this. And it was nice to see the correlation between something that had been birthed to an extent online now kind of like going through this trajectory almost to to getting uh, a space on this massive global platform and i felt completely transported to my own teenage years um to the time where i fell in love for the first time and i, I didn't fall in love until i was in my 20s uh, properly with a man um so so uh so reliving that through uh the prism of these characters was 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 really um transportative you know I really felt like I was in in another world which is which for me is one of the most exciting things about filmmaking is that you can you can step in the in the shoes of somebody else for the duration of that film or, or that tv show when I first read Heartstopper I really responded to Charlie Spring because I just felt there was some essence of me at that age in that character, and I'm sure loads of people do. It's not unique to my experience, um, but he had such a kind of wore his heart on his sleeve. You could read his anxieties in the way Alice had drawn him. He was openly gay, but sort of struggling to deal with all of the issues around coming out at school. Um, so specific, such a sweet character that I just felt... <gasps> I want to see his journey on screen and there's more to, to be had here. And, and so it became then a kind of real mission for me to meet Alice, to pitch to her, to, to come and adapt the, the comic uh, into a television series with Seesaw. And yeah, it was the start of a really great creative journey for both of us. I don't think I was driven by lack or an absence. I think I was driven by a desire to experience, uh, 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 vicariously, um, what Charlie and Nick have for one another, or or what they have with their friendship group, or the relationships they have with their parents and the world, and and that confidence that they had in their um, their sexuality and their discovery of sexuality and uh, their confidence, um, you know, as they take the steps to become out and define themselves and define their sexuality um, was something that I, growing up in, in the 1980s, um, 
di didn't have. It was a very different uh, environment, a very hostile environment. Um, you know, and, and and that's not to say that there aren't hostilities now, but but it 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 felt this piece felt incredibly liberated, and and felt very. Um, it felt revolutionary in a way because of the purity of of the love story it was it was telling and um and I think the strength of my, my the strength of my feelings towards it when I when I first read the scripts and, and then later the graphic novels um I think is is the thing that really drove me to want to be part of it um I think that it kind of all boils down to uh, the idea of creating for the sake of creating um, which fandom and fan fiction operate on a gift economy, which means that um, rather than doing something for monetary gain or because you expect something in return, you do it just to do it. And then maybe somewhere down the road, you get some sort of return from that. So it's like, if I write this story or if I create this piece of fan art, if I put a lot, a lot of um, you know, time and effort into this thing because I want to create it, maybe somebody will leave a nice comment and say that they like it or they will just. Um, you know, share this with their friends or anything like that. And I think that that's really important um, because when you do things just because you love them, the passion in them is very evident. When things come from independent minds or kind of self-published communities, you know, naturally there's a lot of care and there's a lot of thought that's gone into these. And I think one of the things we always need to recognize is the fact that it's a person probably doing this as a side project. It's someone doing this as a passion project that's fully committed to this, but may not necessarily have the resources or, you know, all the traditional kind of education around it to kind of put this project together. But instead, what pushes it is the community and the creators. And I think, you know, because of that, there's that independent frame of thought, but also direction. So there's more creative control of you know, how many LGBTQ characters get to be in there and there's no kind of debate as to whether you know whether this will fit or will it affect ratings or will it affect um, you know the specific opinion of an audience instead it's kind of the creating the community feeding the input and and to an extent the direction of this. I think if if there's a filmmaker that you're constantly thinking about what the audience is thinking I, I don't think it leads to making the best work I think as a as a as a filmmaker you have to tell the story that's that's in your heart um and and the minute um that you're creating that you're you're thinking about oh what will the audience think of this what will the audience think of that you're you're telling the story from what you think somebody else thinks about it and and I think that way um disaster lies I think the intent um of the output kind of differs slightly because independent creators will I think want to play homage as, as much as possible to you know the queer characters the narrative storytelling and I think there's a risk with mainstream content and stories that they may to some extent have to fulfill kind of you know familiar plot lines and storylines and, and may not have as much kind of creative freedom to be as experimental as you'd want. Everything that's in the tv show is has the rubber stamp of approval from Alice herself because they're there and they're involved in the making of it. Um, it's not always the way that doesn't usually happen. Sometimes, you know, what you would mainly do is, is go to a screenwriter to adapt um, an author's work. But I think in this case, it, it really um, helped build the kind of tone and feeling of the show in a way that really matches the experience of reading the webcomic and the graphic novel. But for me, Heartstopper, I think, was this brilliant story between these two characters that had this thought community following from the beginning because it was a webcomic. And then to see it translated on the small screen, but in such a global way, I think was brilliant. And it had not only its original original audience, sorry, um, and its uh, newly acquired audience, a, a much younger demographic as well, I thought, you know, was brilliant. Um, I think it just it really encourages others that that's something that they too can do because I know there are like tons of people tons of, of young folks all over the place who you know their dream is to be a writer or an artist or a creator of some capacity and frequently you know the, the sensible adults are like well that's not 
you know, a reasonable or feasible thing. You need to pick like something that's practical. Um, but seeing the impact and the power that fandom and fan fiction have like in these kinds of spaces um, can like encourage them to pursue their passions regardless of what, you know, the sensible adults in their life have to say. And that in itself, I think is an achievement because a lot of, uh, a lot of self-published kind of well, it's pieces of art or narratives or stories in itself, you know, you kind of think they're almost relegated to this online community. And I think instead they should, it should the, not only the hope, but the scope for something to kind of reach further than you imagined and Artstop has done incredible things and for it to be known and recognized as a webcomic or a webtoon, however people want to kind of refer to it as, I think pays great credit to kind of its origin and, and what can come from those kind of communities. There is much to be said for the power of self-publishing, social media and independent storytelling. The fact that Heartstopper has these origins goes to show that new voices can be heard. The show isn't alone in being adapted from webcomics either. There are plenty of K-dramas that have come from Korean webcomics, as well as a few animated series. These revolutionary stories are out there available for free, and I urge you to go find them. And if you are an artist or a writer or both who is creating these narratives, then Know that your voice is heard and know that your stories matter. I hope you keep creating them. Reviews have all centred around similar words, likeable, endearing, wholesome, earnest. It's an anti-cynical show in its approach. You have to dive in and embrace it like a kid who's too young to have been sucked into the shame-driven idea of cringe. It has a way of encompassing so many characters and so many things going on while also maintaining a story that is understandable, well-paced, and thorough in its job of understanding the nuances that uh, the problems that it addresses. The soundtrack is phenomenal. The way that actors brought the characters to life, the way that editing and everything was done, insane, incredible, beautiful. It's a good, fun show that has no shame about being openly and explicitly queer, but it still portrays the ugliness that can come with being openly queer in a modern day high school. Alice writes from a place of understanding that experience, but also with the intention of creating a show and series that showcases a bunch of queer characters that we as an audience can relate to. I feel like we really underestimate how different this show could have been if it put all its focus onto intensely negative parts of being queer. What strikes me most about Heartstopper is just how normal it is. It's the kind of slightly cheesy love story that straight people have been getting since cinema began. Heartstopper presents an idealized, joyous depiction of queer teens. And not just any queer teens, but a spectrum of queer teens. It's wholesome. Like, it's just very wholesome. Like, it's not overly sexual at all like a lot of coming-of-age shows are nowadays, like drama coming-of-age shows. It really just is a feel-good show, and I feel good because of it. Like, when I ended the show, I was, like, happy. I had a smile on my face. I was like, oh, yes. I think of myself as part of this fan base because when I first read um, Heartstopper, I was like, ah, this is great. And, you know, I would do things like order pins off Alice's um, website that they would send out and you know I've got like little prints of Nick and Charlie that I put up where I live and and it's just a happy beautiful tender love story that people love to feel close to I think so you you read it and you have all of the kind of thrill of reading it for the first time or watching the tv series for the first time but then you want to go back and enjoy it again and again because there's something kind and tender and loving at its core and I think people get a lot of comfort from that and I certainly resonate with that as in as the experience of being a fan of Heartstopper. Fan fiction just as a whole is really accessible um, for storytelling and it um, fosters a sense of community and when you are othered from society, um, which a lot of people who are active in these online fandom spaces are for one reason or another, um, finding this community. I know for me personally, um, I got bullied a lot in school, but knowing that when I got home, I had a laptop full of people who actually cared about me for me, and these were people that I had met in fandom spaces, 
that like looking back now I can see how absolutely vital and important that was for me um because I don't think that like I would have been able to make it as far as I have if it wasn't for those people content that exists online generally it has a huge reach and younger demographics or older demographics are able to access it and I think that's one of the key things audiences should be able to directly have a link to it whether you know it's online whether it's on a specific forum whether it's just a chat room etc or somebody kind of creating content and it's existing on a platform like tumblr or twitter or tiktok um and i think these spaces can kind of birth narratives that we aren't even necessarily aware of that can you know build into tv shows down the line or it, it can lead to being a comic series or even self-published things so there's a reason stuff like fanfic even is so popular and, and continues to be is because there's cult communities whether it's lgbtq stuff or not that continue to feed into this space because they feel like they're represented or they're seen or you know it's giving a platform to marginalized voices that don't necessarily get the opportunity to be heard on the mainstream screen and so people um whatever community you belong to will always seek for that voice in that space like fan fiction is an accessible means of storytelling and when i say that what i mean is that for one it exists largely free and online um, so you don't have like an economic barrier standing between you and uh, those stories. And storytelling is a pillar of society. It's a pillar of um, community and uh, and of just humanity in general because humans need community. And so when you remove those various barriers to gain access um, to these stories, um, you get like a really like just wonderful community surrounding it. And so it's accessible. And the fact that it is free and online and it is accessible and that you get a wealth of representation and diversity and inclusion that you haven't traditionally found in traditionally published media. And when it came to like not being a queer tragedy where you don't have like the barrier gaze trope or, or queer baiting or anything like that. Um, and so that kind of accessibility is really, really important. I think Heartstopper was quite unique in, in terms of the audience that attracted it was a very young audience. Um, who were very familiar with social media and also very familiar with kind of like web comics or webtoons and so it kind of birthed this whole new era of fandom it, it was not only like intensely dedicated to any kind of media output whether you know it was edits or photos or kind of magazine interviews but it was also really joyous quite easy to celebrate something like that we all need something that's quite uplifting and light for me as as the director i felt very free to um interpret and and represent the graphic novels as 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 i felt uh, fit um but of course alice's relationship with the fan base is is very different um and much more um uh is much more of a two-way relationship she has connections with the fans and they connect with her although as the fan base grows obviously that's harder for her to to navigate i think it's difficult not to champion something like this when there's, there's so much joy attached to it and so much creativity um you just kind of want to talk about it and, and i think having quinn is presented in such a positive way in an accessible way that's really important and that feeds into fandom and fandom feed back into that kind of ethos of like queer joy and it's really important so I think that's why it stuck around so much. That I think what it creates is a space and a community and an environment that people want to be in and they want to celebrate Alice's work um, and they want to feel close to the characters. So yeah it's no surprise that the fan base has grown from the first from the first time I met Alice it was growing even at that point and it's just gone exponentially obviously through this this process of making and releasing the television series. Um, but it's no surprise to me, and I think it will keep going because um, working on the TV series and watching all of the cuts of the episodes and being on set as they do take after take after take, usually that can be quite a grueling process on, on other series. But on this series, I've never found it boring once. I always have a smile on my face. It's just the loveliest, most beautiful world to be a part of, and, and it's such a privilege. I mean, I guess it could have gone very much the other way if the loyal fans had hated it, um, which does happen. You know, you see lots of adaptation, you know, some adaptations, um, especially of existing IP, which is well loved, um, are made. The loyal fans reject it and the show dies a death or the film bombs. Um, so I think I think 
you know that that experience could have gone either way and unfortunately it went it went the right way for us so i think when we're talking about queer media specifically i think we have to consider the queer quote unquote sides of social media so for the case of like tiktok and twitter you know these are contemporary spaces that you know social media is relatively new but these are incredibly new um and there's besides branded quote unquote queer talk and stuff like that where you know edits and so on will kind of exist in these spaces for these communities and i think social media has this kind of common denominator of you know community accessibility and shareability heartstopper went from beginning to absolute end to this you know small little webtoon that people knew and loved to this massive global project that was literally everywhere you know it was on the front of magazines it was on posters it was on billboards everybody knew about it and they still know about it and now there's a second season coming so I think you know you shouldn't discredit fan fandom you shouldn't underestimate fandom and I think you know some really incredible stories can come from it With how much the industry has changed in recent years, especially regarding queer representation, it's no surprise that Heartstopper isn't the only coming-of-age show that depicts the queer experience. Nor is it the only show that understands the importance of own voices both in front of and behind the camera, as well as fully rounded characters that exist both with and beyond their own identities. When you're telling a story that is an LGBTQ plus story about young people, you know, it's really vital to make sure that everyone involved understands what what the mission is. And I think we did that as a creative team. I would say the, the creative team of myself, Alice as the screenwriter and creator, and our brilliant director, Eros Lin, um, went about that by going, okay, well, we're all LGBTQ+. How can we assemble as many people around us in the telling of this story who are also from you know, that community. And once you sort of put yourself in that position and you go, you know, this is what what we are and why we're telling this story because it really matters to us, you then find a group of people to come and, and share that with. The first thing that unlocked everything was the casting. And, and, and we made a choice very early on that we wanted to cast actors who are in their teens as close as possible to the actual age of the characters um, to play these parts, which is, which is, you know, difficult to do because those actors have never, usually never acted for screen before. Getting to them is very difficult or has been historically very difficult. We, we got about 10,000 uh, applicants, people uh, who, who sent in their audition tapes, and we whittled those down to uh, a, a core shortlist of about 30 actors, recalled those and um, eventually figured out who the pairings would be um, and, and took, you know, what at the time felt like a really big risk. And now in retrospect, it feels like it was a really easy choice because we had this amazing smorgasbord of talent in front of us um, but I think the the virtue of having done that was that we brought a real sense of authenticity uh, to the representation of um, those characters also having uh, you know making it very clear when we uh, advertised the roles that we were very keen to reach uh, members of the queer community people who identified um, as the, the characters identify themselves uh, to to audition. Um, and I think that definitely brings a, a degree, uh, another degree of authenticity to, to the representation. And the two leading actors, they kind of embody this spirit of like, um, just individuality and, and kind of leads into this queerness in such an authentic and sincere way. And I think across the interviews, across the show itself, everything was as sincere and kind of as heartfelt as possible. So yeah, I thought it was brilliant. Queer representation feels like we're at a turning point, I think, certainly in terms of film and television. I've been working, developing TV series and working on films and stuff for like over 10 years. And, you know, back then when I was first starting out, you wouldn't take on more than one project 
that was like specifically gay or specifically LGBT in some way because it was just presumed by everyone that it would be incredibly difficult to get those more than one story away, you know, within a year. So it was a mentality of, okay, well, you can have a queerest folk and then you might have Russell Davis do something brilliant like Cucumber. You, you know, it wasn't like the sky's the limit. It was, there are a few revered LGBTQ plus screenwriters and they get to tell their stories every so often. But in terms of, you know, something like Heartstopper, I wouldn't have felt that was possible five to 10 years ago. And that's, that's really sad. And, it's, and so it, it's worth celebrating the fact that now this show has happened um, and, and other shows like it are happening as well. I think a lot of people have, have centred on the positivity of, of the show um, as, as the thing that really, um, you know, has, has made it unique. But, but I, I would argue that it's, it's the purity of the love story that, that really um, has struck a nerve. And, and the, that, that wholesome goodness, that, that love or romance or, 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 or even lust can hold. And we're seeing a shift now where you get more of that kind of representation, uh, especially queer representation, um, where, you know, it's not just, you know, trauma porn, essentially, or bury your gaze or queer baiting or anything like that. You get to see um, just queer people existing and, and being happy and not, you know, being the butt of a joke or anything like that. And I think that that's going to be absolutely revolutionary for a whole new generation of queer people because they're not going to have to fight and struggle as much um, when it comes to seeing themselves represented. We as queer people have many, many stories to tell. And, and this is one of them. This is, this is a, a largely positive story, um, largely not centered around transgression um, and, and driven by romance and, and love um, and and something that can be carnal and pure. Um, and I think it's uh, you know it, it's it's one of the exciting things about the show that 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 its positivity and um, it is it is is something that's intertwined with queerness. Like I said, I think it's just like revolutionary that we have queer joy represented as opposed to just, um, you know, queer tragedy because that's not realistic. And I know a lot of people use storytelling as escapism, but escapism can take many forms and not everybody wants to use escape, uh, escapism via, you know, high fantasy. Some people want to read about ordinary people who are like them having ordinary lives because maybe they're in a place like, you know, a, a high school kid who is having a terrible time because they're being bullied, um, you know, for a wide number of reasons, but maybe particularly their queerness. And they can look at these stories that have, you know, queer people who are normal, like them, who aren't, you know, like supercharged with superpowers or anything like that. And they can look and see how they lead happy, healthy, normal lives. And it gives them something to look forward to. It gives them a reason to, you know, like wake up the next day, you know, a reason to be like, I, you know, I have to keep going because I can achieve this one day. And seeing that as opposed to just seeing, you know, being the butt of a joke or um, literally getting killed off in media, it's really, really important. The universality of falling in love is something that is true for everyone. Um, and um, and is something that I wanted to, uh, to try and, and speak to a much wider audience um, about about that experience that that they could empathise with, the essence of of film and television and and narrative art is is about um, is about empathy and creating an empathy with our audience. So our audience who haven't lived as a queer people um, can can also understand. Uh, the humanity and the, those universal human experiences that our queer characters are experiencing. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
you know, it's 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 those two things. You know, the more specific and true to the queer experience we can be, the more chance we're having of connecting uh, with those universal human experiences of of what it's like to be a human being. It's a joyful story to adapt because it has a whole kind of, you know, plethora of characters that that you don't necessarily see being given that treatment in other series. Um, to have Charlie Spring openly gay from the very first frame or panel of the show comic is is revolutionary, I think, for a, for a character of that age. You know, he's he's going through something, obviously, but he is out and proud of who he is and he knows who he is. And you don't often see gay love stories, especially not gay love stories with teenagers in them, where the sexuality isn't mined for a sense of, oh, they've got to keep a secret. There's got to be some element of shame or disguise in the story. And then there becomes the euphoric moment of coming out. Not with this, because Charlie Spring, he's already out. And Elle is already in the process of moving schools um, and has transitioned and and her trans identity is celebrated with love by her friends, but it isn't something that we ever want to kind of concern ourselves with as, you know, the primary focus of the show. You know, as queer people, we're, we're also, you know, we have multiple identities where I'm Welsh, I'm a son, uh, I'm a husband, I'm queer, you know, we, we all carry multiple identities that kind of slot together and make us who we are. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that's exciting about Heartstopper is that, that lots of our characters um, are many things. They're not just one thing. Um, and Elle is trans and her trans experience defines her. Um, but it's not the only thing that defines her. She's the new girl at school. She's trying to navigate friendship, um, and I think I think that's that's one of the things that that the audience really loves about the show, and that I love about the show is that that you know these are um, multiple multiply dimensioned characters. I think representation is super important, but it has to come with a sense of authenticity and. Um, excitement you can't just be going oh this we're, we're, we're telling a story solely to represent a group of marginalized people because no one wants to think of themselves in that way they want to think of themselves as full rounded you know nuanced dynamic people which we all are um and i think that's the approach art stopper takes and that's why the representation within it doesn't feel like a chore it doesn't feel like it's being rammed down anyone's throats it's just here's an amazing ensemble of queer characters. Aren't they all individual, brilliant, beautiful? Don't we love all of them and don't we root for all of them? And that's a fun experience. And I think that that you don't often see that. To echo Eros, the essence of film and television is about empathy and universal human experiences. Like queer people, queer media is multidimensional. 2022 has seen a massive rise in the sheer range of queer teen experience represented on screen. Though totally different to Heartstopper, Empathy and authenticity are still staples of Amazon Freebie's new show, High School. We got to talk with writer and director Claire Duval about the show which screens as part of BFI London Film Festival. High School is um, a television show based on a memoir written by Tegan and Sarah, who are musicians, um, twin sisters, and the story follows them on their journey towards you know, their own you know, sexuality, discovering their own sexuality and um, finding who they are as artists. Something that I really wanted to explore was how, um, what it, just what an internal process it is. And it, you know, which seems like a difficult, doesn't seem like it makes for good TV, but um, the the actors that we found were just so incredible and did such a beautiful job, you know, bringing their their inner life to the screen. I have been friends with Tegan and Sarah for 15 years, over 15 years now, and they sent me their book um, before it came out and I read it in one night. 
Uh, I just, I fell in love with it and I felt so seen by it. It was the first time I had read a coming of age story that I really connected to perfectly. You know, I think, you know, as queer people, there are so few coming of age stories that, um, especially for girls, like it's, you know, you always kind of bend over backwards to fit yourself into a narrative to make yourself feel seen. But this was the the first time where I was like, wow, yes, that was exactly it. And it was so, um, it was so powerful that even as like a woman in my forties, feeling that kind of connection and that, um, that sense of being seen, I just, it was, it, it really, it really had a big impact on me. And I thought, you know, I, I can't be the only person who feels this way. And it just, and I, it just felt like such a great um, opportunity to bring um, this story to life in a different way. It's humanizing, right? I mean, we, I, like as queer people, we can be so othered and people can be so afraid of us for some reason, because it's, because it, for people who are not knowingly exposed to queer people to see that we are still just people, you know, even though, you know, it's 2022, there are still so many, you know, countries and cities and states where being queer is something that is still shocking and upsetting or illegal or, you know, in some places or like grounds to kill someone, you know, it's still like a very real um, threat to people for some reason. I mean, it's changed a lot. Like I remember being an actor in the nineties and if there was a, a show or a movie that had a gay character in it, it was such a big deal. Like it was such a novelty and it was really, you know, uh, and if you can believe it, I got offered a lot of gay parts um, and some of them I did and some of them I didn't because at the time I was closeted and that's just what you did. It wasn't sort of, you know, it wasn't a discussion. You just, everyone defaulted into the closet. Um, so, you know, in the rare, at, at the rare time where you actually got a script that had a, a, a queer character in it, it was really like kind of shocking. And the team, you know, like my team would get kind of nervous and like, uh, are we doing this or what are you, you know, like, cause it was very dangerous for me to do something like that, you know, to take on gay roles. And there were things that I didn't do that. I wish I like looking back, I'm like, why didn't I do that? Just because I was afraid, like it was so, it's such a bummer, you know, but now, you know, it, it's really changed and there are so many out actors and um, it's not, it doesn't feel like, like career suicide to be out now, which is so amazing. And, you know, the content that's being created there, you know, there are lots of, there are so many gay characters or queer characters and queer stories. It just doesn't feel like that big of a deal anymore. It's almost like weirder now when there isn't, you know, because it is, there's been this sort of acceptance and, and acknowledgement of the existence of queer people, which I know seems crazy that it wasn't like that, but it really wasn't like that. And if it was, it was just to sort of like, it was like the gay best friend in a romantic comedy, you know, it was, or someone getting murdered for being gay. You know, there was not, not a lot of in-between, it seemed like. The girls that we found to play Tegan and Sarah, uh, Rayleigh Gilliland and Season Gilliland, Rayleigh plays Tegan and Season plays Sarah. We found them on TikTok of all places. I'm not even, I'm still not 100% clear on even what TikTok is, but I know that that's where we found them. And they were non-actors. They were not trying to be actors. We basically just like knocked on their, like saw the Tegan, they showed up in Tegan's feed it was just an algorithm that was like, hey, are you interested in twins? Here are some twins. And um, there was just something so undeniably like charismatic about them that we, you know, took this big leap in casting them and they worked so hard and did such an amazing job. And it was like finding like two diamonds in the rough. You know, it was just like, it just seemed like impossible. And um, but they, I mean, they really just came in and really blew me away every single day. I mean, listen, I am not a big social media person. I am never really, I, I've never, I don't understand TikTok. And like, I'm very, very rarely on Twitter or Instagram. So it does feel like sort of a foreign land to me. But um, I definitely think that it is, you know, the, the world is sort of evolving and like in this way and social media is, you know, it is, it is a place for creative people to get themselves out there and 
um, it's really exciting to see some of the, the, the people who have gotten their start through being on social media. Historically, queer representation has been minimal, stereotypical, and generally negative, but Heartstopper is a landmark for queer rep, being such a diverse and heartfelt show from LGBT creatives and with such unconventional origins. We still have further to go, but it's clear that gone are the days from the Hayes Code restricting even the implication that protagonists might be queer. So where are we going? I've always been a bit of a cynic when it comes to queer representation and you know I'm rooting for it as much as I can but sometimes things can be pretty bleak on, on the front of representation I think when you say representation you have to be very considered in what it encapsulates yes it includes you know people of colour it includes different sexualities and identities different ages um, different demographics in respect of where they come not just a solely western angle there's there's so many nuances to it um, but I think gradually, slowly, but surely things are getting there. I think um, where it's going is, I think like up, if that makes any sense, like there's only going to be more stories told and the quality of those stories. Like we're going up exponentially in quality and in quantity of these stories. Um, but as for the ones that still need to be told, um, you know, there are a lot of stories about cis gay white men um and, and i think that's really just because like you know there are a lot of you know cis white men in the media or just in, in media in general um and so i think the stories that need to be told are the you know the people who have been othered who have been othered further you need to look more at inter intersectionality when it comes to these kinds of stories uh, i think at its simplest we need more um stories about queer representation i, I think we need a, a variety of, of stories we need stories about rich queers and poor queers and happy queers and sad queers and and um and and, and i think uh having a plurality of uh queer representation on screen is is the key to understanding that queer culture is full of different experiences. I think what we what we found out is that young audiences are so uh, excited and enthusiastic about queer stories and and stories about identity and stories about a point of difference. So it's not about the mainstream anymore. And I think that's so good because the mainstream can adopt stories that are kind of cutting against that sentiment. I do think that, you know, the, the people who are in charge of whether things get made or not, I think they are, you know, catching on that queer stories are, you know, are important and they are wanted and there is an audience for them, for all of them. Thank you so much for watching Hearts Up, and I hope you found this event enlightening. Please do share your thoughts in the comments section, give us a like, and check out some other amazing LFF for free content available on this channel. Thank you to our wonderful panellists for joining me on this project, and goodbye. <laughs>